Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. For 30 years, this TV series has explored a wide variety of issues related to peace, social and economic justice, the environment, and nonviolent social change. We especially provide opportunities for the public to hear voices and viewpoints that are rarely heard in mainstream media. This month, we will focus on a crisis that Congress and Obama and Trump have been making much worse. But this crisis has been largely ignored by mainstream news media and the general public. Decades after the Cold War ended, the United States is recklessly provoking a new nuclear arms race. It's bad enough that our government continues its dangerous intentions to use nuclear weapons, but now our government wants to replace our thousands of nuclear weapons with new ones. Some of these are designed to be more usable for starting a nuclear war. The rest of the world is outraged and is taking historically unprecedented action to stop this madness. Our government says it cannot afford to provide health care or education or safe drinking water and cannot afford to end homelessness <clears throat> or poverty but it plans to spend more than $1 trillion on these new nuclear weapons. Fortunately, people are organizing against that. People are organizing globally, nationwide, and here in Washington State, and right here in Olympia. Although the crisis is extremely serious, we really can solve these problems. If we get the facts, if we devise smart strategies, and if we work hard. So we have two guests with us on this program to help us understand the issues, explore the problems, and develop solutions. I'm happy to welcome Lily Adams. She is the security program organizer for the Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, WPSR. She already had a strong background in community organizing before joining WPSR's staff. In the months that I've been working with Lily and the new statewide coalition about nuclear weapons that she's been organizing. I've been very much impressed with how savvy and how effectively uh, she or has been organizing. So Lily, good to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, thank you. And Bruce Amundsen, MD, is president of WPSR's board of directors. He is a family physician with a very diverse medical career. His career includes practicing in rural areas, working with Russian doctors on nuclear issues, researching diseases caused by nuclear power, and also teaching in medical school. Bruce, good to have you here too. Thank you, great to be with you. We will have a, actually a good time despite how <laughs> serious the problems are. Despite the are. subject. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's been fun working with both of you to develop this. The Cold War ended about 1990, and some nuclear weapons have been dismantled. Most Americans probably assume that the problems have been solved, or at least are under control somehow. But most Americans probably do not realize that the United States has continued in full readiness to launch nuclear weapons against Russia and other nations. Lily, how do you see our current situation? Yeah, I think, uh, like you said, not many people are aware that nuclear weapons still pose a very serious threat to us. Um, and we need to make sure that that's more in the public awareness. Uh, so a really good example of this is that uh, recently this group called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, which is a group of nuclear weapons experts, um, each year they set uh, this thing called the Doomsday Clock, which represents how close we are to destroying our own world. Um, and this year they set that to two and a half minutes to midnight based on where we're at with nuclear weapons and climate change. And this is actually the closest that we've been to midnight since 1953. So it really demonstrates that this issue is still very much something we need to be aware of and working mm -hmm. on. Yeah, and, and, and the public just does not know. Right. And Congress is like asleep at the switch or making things worse. And, and mainstream media have not been acting responsibly. So it's up to us here on this program yeah, to absolutely. set the record and, straight. Uh, with the breakup of the Soviet Union and the, and the calming of some of the conflict between Russia and the U.S., then everybody assumed that this risk had gone away. Uh -huh. And so the issue really went subterranean. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Bruce, I wonder if you could summarize some of the basic facts about the U.S.'s nuclear weapons and our government's policies for using nuclear weapons. Yeah, we went from a, a, a peak of some 25 to 30,000 nuclear weapons over a series of arms treaties. Uh, we now have about uh, 7,500 warheads in our arsenal, but only about 1,500 of those are authorized, are actually uh, prepared to be used. That's the levels that have been achieved. But uh, that's a, a level of nuclear weapons that could destroy life on the planet multiple yeah. times over. Yeah, it's, it's that, still that, a lot of that's overkill. That's the issue. It's, 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 yeah. it's, uh, it's really insane uh -huh. from the standpoint of what's needed. And uh, the U.S. and Russia are still poised uh, with their defenses to launch nuclear weapons within 10 to 20 minutes should there be a, a perception of an attack. So we've lived with this um, uh, immediate response capability yeah. depending on the decisions by our leaders for the last 40 years. Yeah, and, and, and if, if there's the perception that, that some missiles are coming at us or if they have a perception that missiles are coming at them, it takes a few minutes to figure out is this really happening or is this yeah. uh, a, a computer error, is this a whatever? Yeah. And we'll talk about some of that in, a, in just a few exactly. minutes. Yeah. Is there something else, Lily, that you might add to what Bruce has said? Well, I think just to add on to that, um, what we really see with our current nuclear weapons policies is that they're stuck in the Cold War era. Um, and we really need an entirely new assessment of what nuclear weapons, if any, do we need right now? And how should our policies change, considering that it's an entirely different context that it was back during the Cold War? Yeah. And I think people also don't recognize that for decades now, the U.S. policy has been not just a, a protective, retaliatory thing, but the United States policy and our weapons have been designed to launch a nuclear war, to begin a nuclear war, mm -hmm. and these are, we have first strike weapons. They're designed to be used first with such pinpoint accuracy that you would be hitting a missile in the other country's missile silo, mm -hmm. and you don't need that kind of accuracy if all you're doing is retaliating. So the whole, and with more, more detail than we have to go into during this program, uh, it's, it's very, very clear that this is a first strike policy. But, but we also should comment on deterrence, because the concept of deterring depended on two actors, somewhat rational, that were not going to, were going to communicate that they could destroy the other country if they were attacked. When you have multiple nations with nuclear weapons and yeah. unstable nations that aren't acting rationally, we have no ability to deter something between India and Pakistan. Right. So the concept of deterrence in a multi-nuclear armed world largely is flawed and increases the risk immeasurably. Yeah. yeah, and also when you have heads of state who are psychiatrically unstable, which we got in, in mm -hmm. several, several countries. Tell us something about the accidents and near misses, because this is part of the thing, beyond calculations, right. some stuff just goes haywire. Right, so, yeah, so beyond the threat of an actual intended nuclear exchange, um, you know, the history of nuclear weapons just includes this long list of accidents and near misses and m misperceptions. Um, and so, you know, there are, there have been over a thousand accidents documented involving nuclear weapons over the years. But also, I would say those are just the ones that we know about. A lot of this information is classified um, and not known to the public. Um, you know, and there are many examples of these. There have been situations where we've actually dropped bombs accidentally on the United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I remember there was a case in North Carolina yes, some decades exactly, ago where... exactly, in, in 1961. Uh, ...where there were six safety switches and five out of those six snapped. Yeah. And if the sixth one had also snapped when that crashed, uh, we would have lost North Carolina. Absolutely. Well, and they say that was just, you know, two wires that could have crossed that didn't cross, that it was really pure luck. And a lot of nuclear weapons experts say yeah. that really we've gotten to this point where we haven't had an accidental nuclear weapon detonation more by luck than by yeah. the good design of our yeah. system. And the odds are going to catch up with us one of these days. Absolutely. Well, and, and while a lot of these accidents have been technological accidents involving individual weapons, the most significant ones have been misperceptions or technological failures mm -hmm. suggesting on the part of either Russia or the U.S. that a full-scale attack is underway yeah. and the other country has had to respond. And that's happened five or six times yeah. where either Russia or the U.S. has finally decided it was a flock of geese yeah. or a computer error or a cloud formation and, 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 and didn't pull the switch. Yeah. So we've been within minutes yeah. of annihilation several times yeah. and people don't recognize the, that. Well, the public doesn't find out because the news media d cover that up. And, and the government doesn't want to admit how, right. how hopelessly 
uh, dysfunctional it is in protecting How risky us. it is. Yeah. yeah. Just one last thing I would add on that is that even with technological advances, uh, there is still this huge threat that didn't used to exist of cyber attack. Um, and just yeah. to, to demonstrate that, the National Nuclear Security Administration has reported getting millions of cyber attacks per day. Yeah. Um, so there is a huge threat of accident through a cyber attack yeah. as well. Yeah, so some, somebody hacking in or exactly. messing with somebody's computer system mm -hmm. and you're at, at somebody's mercy. People have a vague awareness of the, the horrible destruction that nuclear weapons mm -hmm. could cause. Uh, but and, but people assume that we use them only defensively, and as we mentioned just a, a moment ago, that, that we have this first strike capability. Um, is there a, anything else you want to add about anything about the strategy or the first strike or mm. accidents? Anything else besides what we've said? Do you want to mention the first strike legislation? Yeah, well, I think we're going to talk about this later as well, but there is a bill right now that would limit our ability to have a first strike nuclear attack. Um, but I think something I would say right now in our current context is that, you know, outwardly we have had a policy in the U.S. for decades of only deterrence, of not planning to use these weapons. And then, so it's really shocking to see right now in the current administration comments from President Trump about if we have these weapons, why can't we use yeah. them? Or we might as well bomb them, things like that, or yeah. let it be an arms race. Those things are really yeah. shocking and go against decades it, of our uh, US and, policy. And that has freaked out people around yes. the world. <laughs> because if- It should. If, if, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it should. I mean, if, if, if we, if the US and, and Russia get into something, it's, everybody else that gets wiped out too. Mm -hmm. So well, the, 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 as, as Lily said, <clears throat> the, the, really the big problem is that our, our nuclear weapons policy is bipartisan and frozen. Yes. And nobody is questioning how risky it is to sustain uh, a, a policy of mutually assured destruction uh -huh. ready to launch at any time. I call yeah. it sclerotic. It's completely yeah. ossified. Yeah. And we can get very few members of Congress to really challenge that dominant theology yeah. that's existed for 50 years. Yeah. And yeah. it's a dangerous theology. Yeah, they're just lo really locked into that. And, and mm -hmm. there's like no questioning of the basic It's worked so stuff. far, so we're not yeah. going to change it. And, and right. what I keep saying, and I, I think I might have mentioned already, and I'll mention toward the end of the program, is that every year there's a little bit of risk, a little bit of incremental mm -hmm. odds that, that right. something's going to go haywire. <laughs> and those odds are cumulative. And we've been at this for 70, 72 two years, years now. Yeah. And the odds are going to catch up with us unless we yeah. change that stuff. More luck than design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a local issue, too. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, the Nagasaki bomb had its roots at Hanford in eastern Washington, mm -hmm. and that still is horribly contaminated. It's and in early May, there was a, something went wrong with their uh, radioactive... There was a tunnel that collapsed, and the tunnel had radioactive material in yeah. it. And, and we had, one, oh, quite a, several decades ago, we had a program... Uh, about the Hanford downwinders, and one of right. our guests was a woman who grew up downwind from right. Hanford, where they used to just r release radioactivity deliberately just to see what would happen with the people who lived downwind. Right. And there's a whole lot of people that got health problems. Yeah, we know a lot about that. There's all yeah. yeah, WPSR. <laughs> I've had WPSR guests on this program a number mm -hmm. of times. I mean, there's just all kinds of like criminally negligent stuff that the government's been doing. Hanford is the most contaminated site in the U.S. It's the largest environmental yeah. cleanup project in the United States. Right. And then the Trident submarine, which is a nuclear power first strike thing in Kitsap County, 60 miles north of Olympia, mm -hmm. 20 miles west of Seattle, largest right. concentration of deployed nuclear weapons. I mean, th this is a local, local issue. Yeah. Um, you have a visual that you can show, Bruce, that yeah. compares the Trident submarine missiles to the explosive power of the bomb at Hiroshima. Yeah, let, let, show us? Before I show you that, let me just comment that Washington has a long history in the nuclear era. The first material for nuclear weapons was produced at Hanford, starting in the early 40s, and then at peak production was producing plutonium for many of our weapons, leaving us with this massively uh, contaminated site. But then, in the early 80s, when the Trident submarines em emerged, the, the big debate was where would the West Coast port be for Trident submarines? And Senator Scoop Jackson uh, gave that to uh -huh. Washington. And now we have the third largest concentration of nuclear weapons in the world, 20 miles from Seattle, 60 miles from here, where, 12, where eight of the, of the Trident subs are located. Uh -huh. And each Trident sub has the equivalent power of about 5,800 Nagasaki 
sized bombs. Over 5,000 Hirosh I'm sorry, Hiroshima sized uh -huh. bombs on one submarine. We have 14 in the US fleet. We have the capacity in one submarine to eliminate any nuclear power and, and, and their entire population. That's how bizarre this is. Yeah. And we're planning to replace them. Yeah, with, with another generation, generation. that will persist generation. for decades yep. as, as these have done. Thank, thanks for showing us that. Uh, um, one of the things that I think I've mentioned on every time we've done one of our TV programs about nuclear weapons, and over the years it's been a number of times, is the non-proliferation treaty that people in this country just don't know about. Mm -hmm. And our government has been violating consistently since 1970 in violation of international law. In 1969, the nations of the world were outraged and they took action. They, we passed this non-proliferation treaty to prevent non-nuclear nations from getting them. And the deal was those of us who have nuclear weapons promised to work actively to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. right. And that went into effect in 1970, and we've been violating it ever since. Right. right. Um, could, can you tell us anything else about the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty? Right. So the other thing I would say is that it was indefinitely uh, renewed in 1995. So you know the world has decided this is absolutely um, a treaty that we want to live by, and that we, you know, these are the values that we have of moving towards eventual disarmament. But like you said, especially recently. Um, disarmament efforts have totally halted or you know really slowed down yeah. um, and you, the US is not just maintaining our current nuclear weapons but act, actually rebuilding them um, we're rebuilding new delivery systems even new types of warheads mm -hmm. um, and this could absolutely be seen as violating the non-proliferation treaty yeah, yeah. Uh, article 6 demanded that all the nuclear armed states move towards elimination yeah. And they have systematically ignored that right. in spite of whatever pressures can be brought by the international community. So when we talk a little bit later about the emergence of resistance to that, uh, it's coming about because the non-nuclear nations are saying, you folks aren't abiding by the treaty. Right, and I've got the actual wording from Article 6, which mm. I keep quoting every time we do <laughs> yeah, these programs. Good. It's like, good. pay attention, here's what international law says through the Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Quote, all countries agree to pursue negotiations in good faith to end the nuclear arms race and to achieve nuclear disarmament under international control, right. unquote. Right. There you go. Something I would also just quickly add, you know, saying that we are working to end the nuclear arms race, our current activities are really, in fact, starting a new nuclear arms yeah. race because, like you said, we're spending a trillion dollars rebuilding our arsenal. Yeah that prompts other countries to also feel like they have to do that as well. Right. So instead of decreasing our capabilities, we're actually increasing them at the moment. Right, and that's, and that's sort of the, the dynamics that causes, that, that, that leads to wars on, right. you know, historically. I mean, World War I came along when some countries were arming, other countries said, oh, we better arm too because right. these guys over here are arming. And then somebody else said, oh, we better arm too. And it just, Escalates, and that was in a non-nuclear era. Well, and that was, that was just, the basis of the race, of course, between Russia and the U.S., yeah. right. was assuming that one nation could gain superiority, right. and the race has escalated. We're at risk of that again. Right, and actually, yeah. I, I, I've been studying this for decades, and, and all of the technological, technological advances were done by the United States, then the Soviet Union would try to catch right. up and stuff, and it's been mm -hmm. step and step and step. Um, Bruce, can you tell us something about some, some of the geopolitical crises that are making nuclear war more likely now. Yeah, what, um, with this issue having basically disappeared from public consciousness, um, really three things that have come along more recently have, have put it back sort of on, the, on our frontal lobes and on the, on the sort of the policy uh, uh, debate nationally. The, the first is the almost complete breakdown of relationships between uh, U.S. and Russia. So the ability to move towards additional arms reduction treaties has been completely stalled. The second, of course, is the current issue. And, and this, this was during the last several years. This is not mm -hmm. part of stuff that's been in the news in the early part of 2017. This, no, is, no, like, this, this is, is several years. This of, is certainly throughout all of the Obama administration. Right. Yeah. Uh, secondly, of course, is the recent emergence of North Korea, highly visible, uh, highly um, inflammatory, uh, no real negotiated 
uh, approaches being used. There's more sort of threats and, and, re and yeah. retaliation. So everybody's aware of that. Uh, the, risk, uh, the risk of something happening to us from North Korea are very minimal. That's not their capability. Yeah. But there's nothing stopping the process. And then the third is the existence of really unstable uh, nuclear armed states. India and Pakistan being the best example, yeah. where you have two nations that are fighting all the time on their borders yeah. at low levels, both threatening to use nuclear weapons if they were threatened right. to being overpowered by conventional arms, over which we have no control. So right. all of this sort of coming to the fore, even in spite of the, the Iran uh, nuclear perceived threats being stabilized, we add into that mix a president whose impulsiveness, lack of understanding of nuclear policy, uh, sort of psychologically, psychological instability about yeah. dealing with uncertainty creates a very toxic yeah. stew. And that's what's put this back sort of uh, on the, both the public and the congressional arena. Yeah, and, and, and a really profound ignorance about a lot of substantive issues and a lack of awareness of how ignorant he is yeah. and feeling like he can just go by his gut instincts and he has poor impulse control. It's <laughs> just the worst possible combination it's of... A, yeah. it, it's exactly factors. what has birthed the, uh, the idea of a no first use bill, mm -hmm. which would require Congress to approve a first use yeah. when we have a president who's, whose judgment is significantly questioned. Yeah. Although I would, just to add to that, say that we don't think that any president, regardless of you know, political party or temperament, should have the power mm -hmm. in their hands solely to authorize a first use strike. Right. Yeah. It's particularly concerning at the moment. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, that power should be in no one's yeah. hands. This has been a problem for 72 years. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and uh, um, when we were preparing for this, for this interview, uh, Bruce, you mentioned some, some dynamics at the presidential and congressional levels in recent years that have led the U.S. government to decide to completely rebuild our, our nuclear arsenal. Uh, can you tell us what Obama and Congress have, he, had done these last few years? Yes, just, just briefly. Uh, Obama uh, exercised sort of good faith efforts to achieve a treaty with Russia for some modest further reduction in nuclear warheads. And he did achieve that. The START II treaty, the uh, strategic treaty, the arms reduction treaty, a provided modest reduction, but in order to get support from Congress to do that, and particularly Republican members of Congress, he had to commit to, quote, modernize or rebuild our entire nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. So the impetus for uh, this rebuild that we're talking about came out of a good intention, uh, actually a, a policy accomplishment by Obama and, uh, and, and Russia. Uh, but the price we paid for that now is that they've set in motion this new commitment to modernize or to rebuild. Yeah. And that's what we want to talk more about, and that's why it's so scary. It's, it's unnecessary. Yeah. It's uh, militarily indefensible. It's immoral, and we can't afford it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the, the term modernize is a euphemism, because right. sure. if, if the three of us <laughs> criticize that policy, what's the matter? You're against progress? You're against being yeah. modern? No, yeah. no, no. This is, this is rebuilding. I'm glad you used that term. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it provokes an entirely new arms race. And it is doing that. And that's what it's it doing. Is doing that. Because this is going to unhinge a lot of other countries and, and non-nuclear actors who will mm -hmm. feel threatened. But particularly Russia and China Especially. are already in a, 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 an upgrade on their nuclear capacity. We, we right. know right. that. You can already well, see the effects of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the United States has been threatening Russia. We've, got, we've expanded NATO all the way up to, to Russia's yeah. borders. We've been putting U.S. military stuff all the way up to their borders and missile launchers right. and all kinds of stuff. We've been circling China with the pivot to, to Asia, mm -hmm. which is really a, a military, oh, it's Obama's encirclement of, of China. And it's like, and wonder, all we're doing is provoking these, sure. these mm -hmm. folks. And it's just, it's madness and it's suicidal. Um, Lily, I wonder if there's some other factors or aspects of the, the new nuclear weapons uh, arms race that, that we haven't touched on that you want to mention? Uh, and yeah, well, I think um, something I would just add is that the, one of the biggest problems of this entire rebuild of our nuclear arsenal is that the public just simply does not know about it. And it's also been happening without 
adequate debate in Congress. So, yeah. you know, this is not something that has been voted on by all of Congress. It's not something that the public has been made aware of, and that makes it particularly onerous is that it's happening all behind closed doors yeah. and it's happening unseen. Yeah, the Congress members don't want to be perceived as soft on defense. They keep calling it right. defense when there's no defense possible for nuclear weapons. Yeah. And so in order to avoid being labeled right. soft on defense, they do this reckless stuff right. and, and, and it's... Uh, but, 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 but maybe some specifics about that rebuild will be important for our listeners. It means uh, redoing all three elements of our nuclear arsenal. It, 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 it involves completely replacing the tri fleet of Trident submarines. It, it involves uh, replacing the intercontinental ballistic missiles, about 400 if they were all yeah. replaced, and a new fleet, fleet of highly technological stealth uh, B-21 bombers that are under design. And fantastically expensive. Over a hundred yes. of them. And yeah. the projected cost in the next 10 years is about $400 billion. And to, to, to build out the entire uh, proposed arsenal would, would be an estimated trillion dollars. Right, right. and, and, and the, they, they sell, uh, the, for decades, they've been selling these at a, some price level and then they have cost overruns and of cost course. overruns. Yeah. So yeah. Always and once more you got, expensive. Once you got yeah. money sunk in a project, they don't want to stop it. Right. And, and, and so they just say, well, we'll just pay the extra. We'll just pay the extra. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it becomes a bait and switch the, the, scam. The, yeah. the, the impetus and the momentum of the military industrial congressional complex about this is what's almost unstoppable. Yeah. Because every congressional district has something to gain from it, as well as the psychological or political position that you, if you're right. preserved as weak, you're, 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 uh, you're vulnerable. Yeah. So the, this combined, almost right. undercover complex that makes these decisions is so difficult to penetrate, Glenn, and right. that's what we're trying to do. Right, and, yeah. and what, what, they, what they have done, as you mentioned, in the different congressional districts, I, I remember one of these big uh, weapon systems, might have been B1 or something, they had subcontractors and sub subcontractors and sub sub subcontractors, and they got them into every one of the 435 congressional by districts. design. Yeah. They they by did it design. deliberately so they could co-opt all of the, the Congress right. members. That's it's, right. it's a it's a scam. Yeah, it really I, is a scam. I also think it's helpful just to put this kind of money into context. I know for me at least, a trillion dollars isn't a figure that I can really wrap my head around. That's more than you make from WPSR. <laughs> just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so four hundred billion dollars <laughs> over the next ten years. Breaking that down, that comes out to four point six million dollars spent every single hour for the next 10 years. And I just like to think about, you know, what else could we be spending yeah. that money yeah. on? What would we rather have a trillion dollars, $400 billion yeah. over the next 10 years go to? Yeah. Would it be education or, you know, protecting the environment or healthcare? There are so yeah. many issues that that and, money could be spent and on. And for all that stuff, they say we can't afford that. Can't right. afford that, can't afford that. Right, and how then, many budget cuts are there in other areas? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lily, I wonder if you could tell us about the nuclear posture review that Trump is gonna be releasing later on in 2017. Yeah. Because that's highly relevant. The previous one that Obama had done was from 2010. 2010, and yeah. So this is like seven year update and a new person doing this. Right, so the nuclear posture review is sort of um, the administration's kind of vision for nuclear weapons, how they see their role in the military, and um, it kind of guides policy. Uh, and in 2010, um, President Obama had recently, you know, talked about working towards a world without nuclear weapons, and the nuclear posture review kind of was in line with that, um, and that was the direction people were working. Um, in this administration, it, the, so they're just starting the process of redoing the nuclear posture review. It hasn't been released yet, um, but the concern is that this new administration potentially feels that this goal of a world without nuclear weapons is not a goal that they are interested in pursuing and that this yeah. new nuclear posture review would also reflect that. Um, so there is an effort right now um, in the House to get um, House members to sign on to a letter saying that our new nuclear posture review has to stay with our values that we've had for decades of reducing our own weapons, of ensuring that no other countries can get nuclear weapons or other nuclear material, um, and also just having a more thorough analysis of this truly insane cost yeah. and thinking about, you know, what is actually in, well, necessary. Yeah. yeah, and now the the rest of the world is paying attention to this stuff, even if U.S. Congress, U.S. media yeah. are just like clueless. Uh, Bruce, I wonder if you could tell us something briefly about the growing international movement to ban nuclear weapons, and then we'll follow up with some more 
Yeah, yeah th th this is really important because when the, the rest of the world nations have looked at the nuclear armed nations not abiding by their, their treaty obligation and recognizing that they're at the same risk as everybody else if a, if a conflagration bro broke out, over the last six to eight years, there have been initiatives by some of the more responsible nations, Austria, Norway, Sweden, to begin a discussion about moving towards banning them, much like we've banned other weapons of mass destruction. Uh -huh. That discussion took, took on legs. Over the last three or four years, there's been three international meetings around the globe to try to put some flesh around that. In the meantime, uh, a, a, a non-governmental uh, bodies began to organize under the banner of, of an organization called ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, which is a group, a, a, a coalition of over 400 organizations in something like 80 nations that are coming together and saying, we need to develop a treaty to ban them. And what this has moved now to the point of discussions within the UN that will be reconvened in June, and there's a good prospect that a treaty will be, a, 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 a declaration will be passed that nuclear weapons need to be banned and they're illegal. Mm -hmm. And the, none, of the no, none of the nuclear power states have participated in that right. except yeah. North Korea. Yeah. Um, but it, it, there's a good pros prospect that this will pass yeah. and this won't affect immediately the nuclear armed states except it puts them in a much more embarrassing situation yeah. because the world over 130 nations are likely to sign on to this. Right. So we have two thirds of the world's nations that are saying we have to ban them and then we're saying we have to make an upgraded arsenal. Yeah. And it begins to become even more um, politically and ethically awkward yes. for the nuclear arms states. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I remember uh, last October of 2016, there was effort, activity organizing pr yeah. procedures at the United Nations. Yes. Like, I mentioned that on the nuclear weapons part of the Olympia mm -hmm. for website. And then in March of 2017, mm -hmm. there was more organizing. And you so that was the first session first of session the negotiations. First session began in March, late March. March. Oh, the first uh, committee of the UN, right. Right, in, in late March of 2017. And, and so I do have some information about that on the nuclear weapons part of mm -hmm. www.olympiafor.org. And that can happen in the UN because this first committee that is the structure is, is within the um, General Assembly. And so there's not a veto power available. And that's so important. it's emerging here yeah. as a consensus by those yeah. that want to participate. Yeah, I want to just mention something that we had mentioned in uh, some previous programs that uh, we've done here on, on nuclear weapons about how the World Court, the International Court of Justice, has ruled that the threat of using nuclear weapons is illegal under mm -hmm. international law. Right. Uh, that happened in 1996, and of course everybody ignores that. Right. The, the nuclear right. nations ignore that. Um, and but the, but the, the 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 mere threat of using nuclear weapons is illegal. And and what I tell people is that this is analogous to in within our domestic law enforcement system. Uh, if Lily were to come out and and rob you and 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 threaten you with a gun she could be prosecuted for armed robbery even if she doesn't pull the trigger. Right. It's right. the threat, it's right. you having the gun and threatening that makes it armed robbery. Right. And that's what the International uh, Court of Justice ruled in 1996. In our TV program we, we produced uh, here for April 2009, which people can still see through our website, featured two guests, Jackie Hudson from Ground Zero, Center for Nonviolent Action, and Annabelle Dwyer, she's a globally recognized expert on the international law regarding nuclear weapons, and she was a member of the legal team that had persuaded the World Court to make that decision. Um, and you can watch that interview mm -hmm. and, and at the uh, uh, nuclear at the TV programs part of www.olympiafor.org. Click the TV programs link, scroll down to April 2009, and watch that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that part of the rationale for that was, is that um, that if it threatens the lives of non-combatants. That's, and yes. that's indefensible by both legal and of course moral yeah. standards. Yeah, so I wanna show the, our viewers something that's relevant to this, to the progress that you're saying we need to be making. So uh, in, there is a historical precedent for mm -hmm. the world community to ban certain kinds of horrible weapons. Weapons of mass destruction. Weapons of mass right. destruction, WMDs. How many remember WMDs? <laughs> uh, so biological weapons were banned in 1972. K-1 
chemical weapons were banned in 1993, landmines were banned in 1997, cluster munitions in 2008, and over here, the next step is to ban nuclear weapons. They are not yet banned by treaty. That's our next step. So this is not just like some no. wild right. dream. This is like a progression that we need to pr well, it, persist. It's, 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 a, it's a progression in one sense, but it leaves the weapons that are the most destructive right. out of that sequence. Right, yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have to nail this one next, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing. Um, Lily, I want to check with you about something here. Several pieces of, inter of legislation have been introduced mm -hmm. in Congress yeah. to solve some problems, and you mentioned one already about uh, taking the president's finger off the button and make it go through Congress first. Yeah. Uh, there are. Um, are you? You told me on the phone when we were preparing for the interview that that our members of Congress say they don't hear enough from their constituents that this is even yes. something for them to care about. Right. So, I mean, I think that not many people are calling in or writing into their um, Congress members' office and saying that nuclear weapons are an issue that they really need to be thinking about. Um, I think, as we've said, you know, since the end of the Cold War, for a lot of us, for me until recently, this issue, you know, has kind of dropped off the radar. It's not something on people's minds. Mm -hmm. But we have heard from many of our Congress members in Washington State, but I'm sure it's the same all across the country, um, that they want to hear from their constituents on this, that that will be something that would prompt them to act. Um, in fact, we just met with Representative Adam Smith um, mm -hmm. in the 9th District. Um, and he said, you know, one of the best things that people could do is contact their members of Congress, set up meetings with them. That yeah. That's very powerful. Um, yeah. And so we, that's part of what we're working to do. Yeah, lately he's gotten better on some of these issues. For, for a mm -hmm. while he was not so good, but he, somebody has moved him <laughs> along. He's, uh, yeah, he's, 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 he's become he's made better. a lot of good Quite statements lately. So is there anything else you want to say about the uh, Restricting First Use of Nuclear Weapons Act? Yeah. Is anything else to add to that? Um, well, I think just to yeah clarify, uh, basically this would just say that in order to um, use a first use strike with nuclear weapons, the president would have to get congressional approval, um, basically saying that it's a, a declaration of war, which I can't yeah. imagine anything that would be more of a declaration <laughs> of war than the use yeah. of a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Um, and you know this has actually gained a fair amount of traction. So this isn't the first time it was introduced. Right. It was introduced in 2016 as well. Yeah. Um, but there are now 32 co-sponsors in the yeah. House and seven co-sponsors in the Senate and even uh, one Republican member yeah. of the House who signed on. Right. In the House, uh, Representative uh, Ted Liu, L-I-E-U, yes. is the prime sponsor, mm -hmm. H.R. 669. In the Senate, Senator Ed Markey is the prime sponsor of S-200. Yeah. I, I suspect that people have become alarmed because we have this, this uh, psychiatrically unstable guy with really poor impulse control. Yeah. Uh, with his finger on the button. Yeah. Well, actually, well, and, oh, oh, go ahead. It, isn't the first, it isn't the first time. Mm -hmm. It no. hasn't just happened now because of No, but I'm saying it, Trump. I think that's probably why more people are signing on to the bills. Well, we hope so. More yeah. people are alarmed. <laughs> we hope by so. This. There's yeah. also the SANE Act. Uh, we're tight on time, so I want to see if we can move through a number of things. The SANE Act will be introduced by Blumenauer and Markey. Mm -hmm. um, and can you tell us what that would do about reducing warheads? Yeah, so this is a broader legislation that um, covers, would um, call for reductions um, in all different parts of our nuclear arsenal, so to our nuclear submarines, to our bombers, to our intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, so, you know, whereas the first use bill is very specific, the SANE Act um, is a little bit broader. Yeah, and there's also a, a Senate bill uh, to uh, uh, cut nuclear cruise missile yeah, so there's an entirely new um, nuclear weapons delivery system called yeah. the um, Long Range Standoff Cruise Missile that would cost 20 to $30 billion, yeah. and that the Pentagon itself has said has a use beyond deterrence, that it's not simply to deter, yeah. but that it would be used in a war. It's a very provocative weapon. Yeah. Right. We're, we're tight on time, so I, I do want to move through a couple things. There, um, we, w we want to support the good legislation. Right. We want to support the bad legislation, including this expensive rebuild of everything. Um, and then can you introduce a one minute video that people can see um, that folks in my generation and your generation will remember <laughs> from uh, as, as uh, rekindling the, the imagery from the 1964 right. presidential campaign. Yeah. Uh, tell us what this video is and then we'll insert this for a, a one minute. 
Sure. So yeah, in the uh, early 2017, uh, WPSR created this uh, video. It's an ad that was that aired on TV, and it uses the footage from the Daisy ad from Lyndon B. Johnson's presidential campaign, like you said, in 1964. Uh -huh. um, of kind of the iconic girl with her flower, and then the huge nuclear explosion. Yeah. Um, and we used it to really show, you know, as you said, that this is not, you know, even though the Cold War is over, this is just as pressing as it was back then. And we talk about yeah. this huge spending on our nuclear weapons and how important it is to contact your Congress members to oppose yeah. it. Yeah, thanks. So we'll, we'll watch that, and then I want to follow up with you folks about the sponsoring organization. Sure. The world is still awash in nuclear weapons, the most destructive weapons ever produced. The United States Congress is embarking on a plan to rebuild our entire nuclear arsenal. The estimated cost? Over one trillion dollars. This includes the submarines based at Bangor, Washington, just 20 miles from Seattle. Please, contact your member of Congress and insist that they oppose this new and dangerous nuclear arms race. So, in order to do all this work that we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, people create nonprofit organizations to do the good work. And I, I very much appreciate uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, which for decades has been doing this. And you've been a member for a very active member mm -hmm. for decades. At the state level, uh, it's Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. So the websites are www.psr.org for the national and www.wpsr.org for the mm -hmm. state level. Bruce, you're president of WPSR's board and you have a lot of experience. Uh, can you tell us uh, briefly why PSR and WPSR oppose nuclear weapons? Uh, PSR actually was birthed out of the Cold War. Uh, at, at the height of the Cold War, when, uh, when U.S. policy was talking about surviving, evacuating cities, duck and cover, uh, physicians basically said there is no treatment, there is no, there is no reasonable response to a nuclear war. So we began to push back with the whole idea of a prevention is the only cure. That was 55 years ago. We've had a chapter in Washington for almost 40 years, and, the, and, the, and the, the movement to reduce and abolish nuclear weapons has been central to our mission all along. And when uh, things began to heat up again uh, a couple of years ago, we looked around and said that there is not another organization in Washington whose, mi whose primary mission is to try to address the issue of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So we began to gear up. We uh, put together an, an expanded task force. We looked at resources. We brought Lily on board as a staff person. We began to create a coalition. So we're committed to create a statewide civil society pushback on our Congress people that was equivalent to what happened at the height of the Cold War in the 80s in order for our Congress people to know this is not acceptable. Right. So it's central to our mission. Our, other, our, our mission is addressing what are the major threats to the health of the human community, yeah. climate change and this. Yeah. And we're pushing this very hard and we're really pleased to see the responses. People get it. Right, yeah, I, I've been, uh, I appreciate Lily's work in the months that we've been working together. Mm -hmm. I've participated by telephone link with all of the, mm -hmm. the monthly meetings yeah, that Lily has committed. Appreciate that. I've been very much impressed with uh, not only Lily's work, but also the, the savvy people participating and the organizations that are joining in with this coalition. This is very much a happening thing. Yeah. And people whom I've known and respected for decades are right on board with this. So mm -hmm. this, right. this is taking off. Um, yeah. Can you tell us some more about what you're trying to accomplish with, with this new uh, uh, Washington coalition to stop the new nuclear arms race? Yeah. Um, so the coalition is fairly new. It just started in the fall of 2016, um, but it's grown really fast and we've seen a really wonderful response, as you both have said. So now we have um, just over 20 member organizations in the coalition, um, and they're from a variety of different um, 
you know, areas. So we have a lot of peace groups and, you know, neighborhood groups that we also have environmental organizations. We have a couple of different faith groups involved. Uh, we have um, social justice organizations, health groups. So it really is a mix. Um, and we're also all over the state. So we're not just based out of Seattle and Olympia, but uh, you know, our goal is to have members in every congressional district yeah. in the state. Um, and you know, as our name suggests, the Coalition to Stop the New Nuclear Arms Race, we're really focusing on this rebuild of our nuclear arsenal and the trillion dollars being spent. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple of things that we're really focusing on. So one is, um, you know, engaging our members of Congress. And so part of that is meeting with them um, and, you know, talking to them in person, but also uh, getting their constituents to really, as we said, contact them to show them that this is an issue they care about. So we're having people all across the state call or write into their yeah. members of Congress. Um, and then we're doing a lot of educational work. So holding events, doing things like writing letters to the editor and opinion pieces in the media uh -huh. so that more people are hearing about yeah. this. Um, and then just working to continue to expand our coalition and reach more people. Yeah, for, for an issue like this where the, the mainstream media don't have the sense or the gumption or the whatever to generate mm -hmm. their own articles, this is something where letters to the editor can raise the issue where it comes out of the grassroots and we can right. say, hey, this is important, pay attention. And that helps to make something a, a hot right. issue. Yeah, well, something like these truly historic negotiations in the UN around a ban yeah. on nuclear weapons was the, barely covered in a yeah. lot of media. Yeah. And so we work to do exactly that, get opinion pieces in yeah. so that more people are hearing about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, and I wanna let people know they can contact the Washington Coalition to stop the new nuclear arms race. Um, through WPSR.org. Mm -hmm. The phone is in Seattle is area code 206-547-2630, or they could email you, Lily, yes. with a total of three L's in yep. it, L-I-L-L-Y <laughs> at mm -hmm. WPSR.org. Yeah. Um, uh, are, is there anything else you want to say briefly? We're really quite tight on time. Anything yeah. brief about the plans for the future or... Um, well, what I think I would really like to let people know is that there are ways that you as an individual can get involved and can help. Um, you know, I think this issue seems so large that it's, it can be hard to think about how can I get involved in this. Uh -huh. So I think the coalition is really providing that opportunity. So if you're part of an organization, you can be involved. We have a local committee right here in Olympia, yep. which we might talk about a little I'll, bit I'm more. I'm going to plug that next. Great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that's something where, where no matter where you are when you're watching this program, mm -hmm. you might watch it on the local community access cable station, or you might be watching this through our website from elsewhere. Yeah. But in your own community, start a local group yeah. um, and work on this and then connect with other, there's a lot of nationwide groups working on these things, but I know mm -hmm. WPSR is doing amazingly good work here in Washington, but other groups are, exist elsewhere too. For, for the Olympia group, we joined the coalition uh, in, in early 2017. We created a new committee to work on this. Uh, we held our first meeting in May of 2017. We'll hold our Second meeting on Wednesday, June 7, at 7 p.m. at Traditions Cafe downtown. Um, and then people can contact nuclear weapons at olympiafor.org, or they can phone me at 360-491-9093. We have a lot of information posted at the nuclear weapons part of our website, www.olympiafor.org. And we'll be reaching out in various ways through our community and hope that other people in other communities will do likewise. And mm -hmm. I appreciate your participation in our first two Absolutely. meetings. Absolutely, it was wonderful. Yeah. I think this was yeah. a meeting with a lot of energy and that's what we're hoping to see you know, yeah. all across the state. And some people will remember, some local folks will remember that, that in 1982, the Thurston County Nuclear Weapons Freeze Campaign had organized during the height of the Reagan buildup. And we, we won a countywide ballot issue in November 1982 with 62 and a fraction percent of the ballot of the votes, which is really a landslide. In 2005, local people organized Beyond Hiroshima events. Uh, we succeeded in getting the Olympia City Council to unanimously pass an anti-nuclear resolution as part of a nationwide organizing effort by mayors across across the country. So there's a lot of things we can do. Um, mm -hmm. it's, and there are so many angles. I mean, this is, we've talked about the danger aspect. We've talked a bit about the health. There's more health aspects because there's mm -hmm. health risks in mining uranium and processing for the weapons and there's all kinds of health problems. There's funding issues and the trade-offs of, 
what do we need instead of this money? We've talked about that. Right. Um, there's a moral angle, and you mentioned some faith communities are part of this. Uh, some years ago, the late Catholic priest Richard McSorley stated very directly, it is a sin to build nuclear weapons. And he wrote, the taproot of our violence in our society is our intent to use nuclear weapons. And he was able to tie everything to that basic fatal flaw, really, in our, in our society. Um, and, and there's all kinds of, all kinds of angles and, and ways for people to, to connect. Yeah, I think also just the thing is is that this is a universal issue because everyone would be affected if nuclear weapons were ever used. They're so yeah. inherently inhumane, so indiscriminate that you know these really this would affect everyone. Right, and and you had mentioned Bruce a, f a few minutes back about how it was other nations that that raised this at the international level through the General Assembly of the UN because they're they're affected. It wouldn't be just you know Russians and Americans wiping each other. We'd be wiping out. The rest of the world. So everybody has a stake in this, and that's true in every community because no matter where you live, you've got stuff that's not getting funded in your community because the money is going to this. Right. We think the we, we think that the moral card uh, may be one of the most uh, powerful cards we can play. Uh -huh. um, there's not a single moral or ethical system that justifies destroying large numbers of non-combatants yeah. under the guise of self-preservation or defense. So in the 80s, uh, a big portion of the resistance to nuclear weapons came out of the religious communities. Yes. The, the Catholic Church for decades has had a position that the use of nuclear weapons was, was immoral and indefensible. Yeah. Similarly, uh, the Protestant faiths and the, most of the others. Yeah. So we are making a major effort to bring uh, not just individual churches, but the organizations of faiths yeah. back into this. Yeah. The Catholics were instrumental uh, in the work with us in yeah. the 80s. Yeah. We're working with them again. We're asking yeah. them to come back in. Yeah. So the, the, it's very difficult, I think, for a member of Congress to stand up and defend this on, 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 the, on the basis of some yeah. moral standard, whatever our national yeah. needs are. Right. Yeah, I remember when, uh, when, when that activism was happening around the Trident, and. Uh, one of the religious leaders referred to the Trident Nuclear Seminary Base in Kitsap County as the Auschwitz of Puget Sound. Yeah, that was a Catholic archbishop. Yep, uh, yeah, Raymond Hunhausen and we, uh, did that. And he took a lot of heat from people higher up from him. Right. But, That's right. But, but he was like right on top of this. And he refused to pay us income taxes because right. of... Mm -hmm. this. So, so we're, we, we're, we need to. We're calling on his good experience to bring the right. Catholic leadership back into right, the right coalition. On. So. Um, uh, when, when we consider these things, um, there, there are so many ways for people to connect and so many right. motivations that we, we really need to do this. We're just about out of time, um, and I, I want to let people know that there are a lot of sources of information. We will post these in a PDF document uh, next to the link for watching this program on the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation website. So visit www.olympiafor.org, click TV programs, scroll down to June 2017, click the link to watch the program, and the title is Confronting the New Nuclear Arms Race, or click the link next to it for a PDF summary that has a lot of resource information, more than we have time to list mm -hmm. here. We also, uh, at that PDF link, will also mention the TV programs about nuclear weapons we've done in, in previous years, uh, July 2015, March 2013, April 2009, April 2007, July 2005. Those are all available on our website. So you have to just keep scrolling way, way down and watch, uh, click any of those that you want to watch. I want to thank uh, Lily Adams. I want to thank Dr. Bruce Amundsen for being our guests during this interview. During this interview, Lily and Bruce have urged our viewers to understand that even after the Cold War, this is a very important issue that absolutely needs our urgent attention and our strong action. Indeed, this has been a recurring theme for all the programs we've done about nuclear weapons over the years, and it's just getting worse again now. Uh, it seems like a familiar metaphor of the, the frog in the bucket where uh, you right. heat up the water bit by bit by bit and the frog will cook because it doesn't have enough sense to recognize the... the um, an abrupt change in the temperature and jump out and it gets cooked and kind of that's what we're doing here with 
the odds against us every year, Slowly every year. Slowly cooking ourselves nuclear and weapons. And we're going to do that. And this has been with us for 72 years. We need to jump out. When the Cold War ended, people thought the dangers were reducing, but the problems have been increasing in recent years. And the Congress and Obama and Trump have all been proposing making things very much worse. News media and politicians are not paying attention. It's up to us, we the people, to fix this. And uh, the odds will catch up with us unless we turn things around. The United States is the only nation to have actually used nuclear weapons against other nations in, uh, by exploding them. We have more than other nations. We have led the advances in the nuclear arms race. Other nations have then responded by trying to catch up, but that way is, is madness. Uh, our first strike weapons are provocative. We have been violating the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty continuously since 1970. We set a terrible example to other nations. The U.S. has no moral authority to tell other nations what they can and can't do about nuclear weapons as long as we have been violating international law about nuclear weapons for so many deca decades. We have the responsibility to lead. Both political parties are at fault. This is not partisan one way or another. It is a bipartisan problem. It's a, part of, it's a problem of our whole national culture. We need to stop that stuff. So they are pushing us towards suicide. We the people have to stop the madness. We the people have to prevent the suicide. Please help. You can get information about a wide variety of topics related to peace, social justice, and nonviolence by contacting the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093, www.olympiafor.org. We are all one human family. We, can, we all share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to work at it, and the world needs your particular ways of helping. Thank you so much.